webinar held by the Education Cluster Information Management Community of Practice. Uh, today we have uh, with us Bola Salonicchio, who is the CEO and co-founder of Datadyne. Uh, Datadyne is the creator of uh, Magpie, which is formerly Epi Surveyor. And today we're going to have a presentation on uh, mobile data collection and SMS-based uh, data collection from, from Joel. So we're very excited about that. Well, uh, I turn the time over to you. Thanks very much, guys, uh, and thanks for having me. So I'll try to speak slowly and, uh, and clearly, but let me know if um, this is not coming across to everyone in the group. Again, for the audience, if you have a question or a problem, go ahead and type that into your chat box uh, so that the uh, mediators can, uh, or moderators rather, can go ahead and relay that to me. Um, so I'd like to talk to you, as, as was said, about our Magpie mobile data system. Uh, for those of you who've been in this business for a while, you may remember the name EpiSurveyor. That's what we used to call the system. Uh, that was because it was designed to do epidemiological surveys, but what we found is that uh, people use it for much more than epidemiological surveys, so we've changed the name uh, to basically not make people think it is limited to, to health or epidemiology. Now certainly when I ask the question, how many people on the call use Yahoo Mail or Google Maps or Skype, certainly I think everyone on the call uses one or all or some of these things or very similar things like Gmail, etc. And it's worthwhile reflecting about how we use these technologies. Did these technologies, when you signed up for for Skype, did it require technical training? No. When you use Google Maps, did you have to hire a consultant to use Google Maps? Of course not. And likewise, when you ask, well, how much do these things cost? How much does a Yahoo Mail cost? The Yahoo Mail account cost? Nothing. Unfortunately, the current systems for mobile data collection are quite the opposite. They're complex and they're expensive, and we think that that's why most people still collect most of their data on paper. We're trying to adopt the same model as Gmail and Skype and Facebook and all these other products that we use all the time. And that model means that it's based in the cloud, based on the internet, doesn't require training, doesn't require programming, doesn't require consultants, and is very inexpensive. What Magpie does, uh, very basically, is to take the, the data that you can see in the truck on the left-hand side of the screen and that data is just one district's worth of vaccination coverage survey. This is from a district in Zambia. We were trying to discover what was, what was the percentage of children during a vaccination campaign who had been vaccinated. You can imagine that for the rest of the country, that's probably about 100 similar trucks. But rather than collect the data on these piles and piles of paper, the idea is that you can collect the same data by viewing the questions on a phone or a tablet instead of viewing them on a piece of paper. And obviously you can imagine the advantages. Like so many other web-based systems like Facebook or Google Maps or Gmail, you go to an online site, you go to a website, and on that site you can create forms and you can then push those forms to a variety of common mobile phones. And those include both Android and iPhone or iPads but also even basic phones like the phone you see all the way on the right. Again, important to emphasize this. Magpie does not just work with smartphones. You can use Magpie with a you know, $30 Nokia uh, feature phone. Also important to note that you can use any language or alphabet. I think you can see in the illustration, um, if you can make out the type, uh, the, the form that's showed on the screen is in French, but you can use not just any any language, but also any alphabet. We have folks who are collecting data in Arabic and Burmese and many other languages. Now, there are two methods of collecting data in the field with Magpie. The first method is using an app on the phone. Now, nowadays, many people have smartphones, and they're used to the idea of, collect, of having apps and installing apps on their phone, these little programs or applications. The disadvantage of using the app on the phone is that you have to have a phone that's got some memory in it and is fairly sophisticated. What that means in practice is that to use the app 
your phone has to probably be about $30 or more. Phones costing less than $30 generally don't have enough memory to run the application. But if you do have such a phone, or your data collectors do, there are many advantages to using the app. You can have questions that skip. For example, if the person answers yes to the first question, it can skip to the tenth question. You can make certain questions required. There's a very nice interface. There are many, many advantages that lead to increased data quality when you're using the app. The second type of data collection, though, is to use SMS to send data into the Magpie system. Now, the single advantage of using SMS is that it runs on any phone at all. As people know, even a $5 you know, cheap knockoff phone can send text messages. And so any phone at all, any phone in the world, can be used to collect data, usually simple data, using SMS and, and sending it into the Magpie system. Um, one disadvantage of the SMS system, though, is that is a paid feature of Magpie. Later in the presentation, I'll talk to you about the free version of Magpie and the different paid versions of Magpie. I'll always let you know, as we're talking through this presentation, about which features are paid features. If I don't mention it, it means that the feature I'm talking about is free. So again, every time I'm talking about something that requires a paid subscription, I'll let you know. So again, most people are using the app, the system on the left-hand side to collect data, um, using phones that cost $30 and up with many different advantages. Some of our users who have paid subscriptions are using SMS. And in fact, we'll demonstrate that SMS system uh, during the course of this webinar. Now, once you collect data with Magpie, whether by SMS or by using the app, and you send it into the system, you can see the data represented in a variety of different ways. There are some simple reports. You can see a list of the data, which is there at the top. You can see basic graphs of your data. And if you used a phone that has a GPS chip in it, you can also map your data um, using Google Maps within Magpie. All of the representations you see here of the data can be exported. So you can export your data, for example, to an Excel spreadsheet or to a text file. You can export the reports. You can export the map data to Google Maps. And all this is available in the free version. Again, I'll always tell you if anything I'm talking about requires the paid version. In terms of connectivity, it's pretty simple to figure out what you need connectivity for with Magpie. Anytime that you're using the website, that obviously means you need to have the ability to connect with the website. So all the stuff on the left, that's things that you do um, using the website, like creating and editing forms or creating reports. Or if you want to transfer data from your phone to the website, it means you need to be connected. Everything on the left requires a connection to the internet uh, of any kind. It could be Wi-Fi, it could be cellular, uh, any type of connection. On the right, you can see that importantly, you do not need to be connected to any network to be able to collect data on the phone. So you can go off into rural areas, you can be way out in the middle of nowhere, collect data for weeks and weeks, and then once you return to a connected area, you can upload that data to the website. It's also important to realize you can transfer your data from the phone directly to a laptop or a desktop um, if you want to do that. Most of our users upload the data to the website, um, but it's not a requirement at all. It takes at most, I think, about 60 seconds to go to magpie.com and register your account. Uh, most people take maybe 30 minutes or an hour to watch our introductory video and to learn the system. We've really tried to make the system to be as simple to use as Facebook. And what that means is that you really can be collecting data on Android or iOS or using a Symbian phone or SMS. You could be doing that today. Honestly, most people don't take more than an hour or two to learn the basic functions of the system. We put the system online 
uh, in, back in 2009. And since that time, we're now at, at about 21,000 users in more than 170 countries. We have more than 1,000 new users signing up each month. And importantly, 99% of those users pay nothing at all to use the system. And I'll talk more about the economics of Magpie and the subscription costs. Also important that this entire system is programmed and supported by our Kenyan team in Nairobi, who are terrific programmers um, and have been with us, many of them, since the beginning of Magpie. Um, we've also gotten a lot of recognition and a lot of organizations, well-known organizations, who are using Magpie. Probably, I think for us, the, the most important piece of recognition was the top one on the right, the Wall Street Journal Technology Innovation Award, because this is an award that is not given for international development or for tiny organizations like Datadyne. This is an award that's just given for worldwide technology innovation. It was won the year before we won it by the Microsoft Corporation. I'm sure everyone has heard of that. And the year after, it was won by the Raytheon Corporation, which is a multi-billion dollar defense corporation in the United States. So we think with our small organization of Datadyne, we're doing pretty well to be recognized in that way. I'd like to give you some examples of how uh, Magpie can be used, or how Magpie is actually being used in the field. Um, folks may have heard of the JSI organization, John Snow Incorporated. JSI is a big um, organization that does health projects in development, usually USAID funded. JSI is the contractor for the Deliver project, and in numerous African countries, they are tracking malaria medicine supplies. This is part of the US President's Malaria Initiative. So they're using Magpie as a supply chain management system. You can see the worker in the photograph who's using a basic phone to be able to enter data. That's, I think, a Nokia phone. Important to recognize that they use the paid version of Magpie because they want to do certain paid features in Magpie. Also important to recognize that their total technology cost is about $5,000 per country per year, which is quite low. I think it's actually probably closer to maybe $5,100 or $5,200 per year because probably their data uh, data sending costs, um, their connectivity costs, are probably a couple hundred dollars per year. The Kenya Ministry of Health has been a partner with Datadyne for several years now, actually for more than several years. When I was a CDC epidemiologist some years ago, I was working in Kenya. One thing led to another, and that's why Datadyne is now based in Kenya. We've been working with the ministry, and they are very nice to help us to test out the system. What this means is that the Kenya Ministry of Health, who uses the free version of Magpie, is very fluent in using the system. And they're able to set up uh, data collection systems on phones for a whole variety of things, including outbreak investigations, supply chain management, etc. They have never required Datadyne to send consultants to help them out. They're perfectly able to figure this out on their own. Outside the field of health, a great example is the organization called CAMFED, which is an abbreviation for the Campaign for Female Education. Camp, CAMFED pays girls in five sub-Saharan African countries to stay in school. They give money to the families if the girls stay in school. And CAMFED monitors the grades and attendance and the disbursement of money within the program. They used to do this on paper. And when they did it on paper, they would have teachers, and this is really hundreds of teachers across these countries. The teachers would fill out a paper form, and it would take about two years to get the data from the paper form into the system and to create a report with that. Right now, they use Magpie with basic Nokia phones to have the teachers enter the data on a daily or a weekly basis, and they have real-time web-based dashboards showing them all the attendance records, the grades, down to the, the district, down to the school, down to the girl. And again, equally important to note that this costs them altogether, 
the technology costs to have this real-time monitoring system for five countries is about $12,000 per year. Again, this is an exceptionally low cost. We don't mean that it costs $12,000 plus the consultant's fees. We don't mean $12,000 a year plus per diem or $12,000 a year plus hotel costs or airfare because none of those things are required. CampVet has never required a Datadyne consultant to go out to the country for any purpose at all. They've done all this themselves. Within the developed world, we have the Canadian government working with several universities in Canada who are, basically they have farmers using basic mobile phones reporting illness in a variety of different uh, animal uh, herds, I guess. Uh, this is both in pigs and also in cows. The, the government of Canada uses the free version to be able to do this. And it, as an example of a very simple survey that was done, this is the group called Internews. Internews is an NGO that is concerned with the access to information of refugees. Internews heard about Magpie, went to the website and registered. They did a survey of several hundred refugee households in the Dadaab refugee camps of northern Kenya. They were able to collect the data electronically with no consultants, no training, completely on their own, using the free version, and then they were able to publish this. I only found out about this use by doing a web search on Google and searching for Magpie data collection, which I do about once a month, to try and find these examples of great organizations that are using Magpie, even the free version, to do terrific work in a variety of fields. So after those examples, some of the questions people often ask us are about data security. Um, so on every device, Magpie is always password protected. Um, you can encrypt your data. That is to say you can, you can make the data so it is not readable to unauthorized people. This is very easy to do on BlackBerry, also iPhones and iPads. Um, usually it's quite easy to do also on Android devices. The data is also encrypted when you're uploading it from the app to the website. When you're using SMS, however, it's not encrypted at all. SMS is not a secure method of transmitting data. Um, on our website, the data is password protected and encrypted. We also back up our entire system four times a day, including from the, including to the, our main servers, which are located in one U.S. city, to a completely different server in a different city, just in case the system goes down in our primary site. We're able to recreate the system entirely um, from the data backup uh, in the other site. So the data is both secure and also backed up automatically with no effort on the part of the users. I can't emphasize enough that Datadyne makes no claim to own your data at all. And this is in indicated in our terms of service, which you agree to when you create a Magpie account. The user owns their own data. Datadyne can't see your data. We can't use your data. We can't look at your data unless you give us permission to do that. Now most of our users upload their data and they store it on our servers. The servers I mentioned that we back up are based in the United States and we, they're provided to us by the Rackspace Corporation. But any user can choose to store their data anywhere they want to do that. Of course, if you want to store the data on your own computer, we're not going to buy you the computer to do that. You'd have to pay for that yourself. In terms of data quality, um, people often ask us about the difference between data quality. Certainly, um, let me just pull this all up. People often say, well, when you're collecting data on paper, the supervisor can look at the data as it's being collected. But let's face it, the supervisor in the field can only look at some of the paper records. Right? There's never time to examine all the paper records being collected. So most of the review of data when you're using paper happens long after the data collection is finished. In addition, paper forms can't enforce data quality. People often ignore skip patterns, etc. But if you're collecting data electronically, you can have a supervisor, even a supervisor in a different country, who is examining all the data at the moment it's being collected and uploaded. And by doing this, you can actually prevent errors from happening or identify errors quickly. 
we're also going to be adding more reports to enable our users to have real-time quality analysis of data as it's being collected. I would encourage everyone to try Magpie just to see what I'm talking about. It's quite remarkable when people are collecting data, for example, all around your country or all around your program, and you're watching that data being collected in real time. It's quite, quite amazing and leads to greater data quality. For us, the bottom line is that compared with paper or with other mobile systems, data, uh, Datadine's Magpie increases the data quality and decreases the time, the cost, and the effort. There have been studies done by JSI and the World Bank and other organizations. Each of those studies have found the same thing. In general, they found that with Magpie, the time to collect the data was decreased moderately. The cost to collect data was decreased dramatically, and the effort was also decreased. In fact, the World Bank found that the cost of collecting data using Magpie was 71% less than the cost of collecting data using paper. And you can imagine all the costs of collecting data with paper, including photocopying and transport and fuel, etc. So 71% is obviously a very significant decrease in costs. Now, everything I've been talking about up to now is messaging and, or is data collection, but we're also going to be adding messaging into Magpie. Many of our users have asked us if we can allow them to, for example, text the data collectors to let the data collectors know of a certain event or to remind the data collectors uh, that they should start collecting data or that they should upload their data. And uh, they've asked us to do this via SMS or some other method. So we are, we are going to be adding uh, timed, easy to use SMS messaging built into the Magpie account. Like the data collection aspect, this is designed to be so simple that anyone will be able to set up reminders or educational messages um, in, in just minutes without having to have programmers or consultants. And that is being beta tested right now in the United States and will be released. It will just be part of your Magpie account um, and that will appear in September. The messaging will allow you, just like you create forms online, you can enter messages online or import them and then schedule them to be sent to your contact list. And then those messages will appear on the screen of the phone. And you can see here just a simple text message to remind people to get vaccinated appearing on the screen of an iPhone. Since uh, the example here is a text message, of course it could go to any phone. But in addition to SMS messaging, we're also going to be adding uh, two types of audio message. So SMS messages, of course, can only go to mobile phones. They can't go to landline phones. Also, SMS messages are not useful for illiterate populations. If they can't read, they won't be able to read your text message. So we're going to add the ability to type a message into Magpie, and the system, instead of sending it as a text message, will be able to dial the phone number of the recipient, whether it's a mobile number or a landline, and read the message. Uh, the computer itself will read the message to the recipient over the phone. Again, enabling us to reach both landlines, but also, importantly, to reach illiterate populations. I told you I would talk to you about the cost and the features of the different versions. So here you see the three different types of Magpie subscriptions. On the left-hand side, the free account. The limitations to the free account is that the, probably the most important one is that you can only upload 500 uploads per month. An upload is a completed form. So if you create a form at the Magpie website with 50 questions in it, and you download it to phones, and someone in the field answers those 50 questions and sends that to the website, that counts as one upload. So again, with the free version, you're limited to sending to the system up to 500 uploads or records uh, per month, which is a total of 6,000 per year. Now, 99% of our users are using the free version, so you know that uh, this, this limit of 500 per month 
is actually not too much of a limit at all, but it is an important thing to keep in mind when you're planning the costs. Now, if you use the middle level, which is $5,000 per year, our pro account, it removes that limit so you can collect an unlimited amount of data and uploads. It also allows you to do SMS-based data entry. Again, you can't do SMS data entry using the free version. If you upgrade to the top level, the enterprise level, that allows you to use uh, some features like our API. The API is a technical feature that enables you to connect your Magpi data to other computer systems. For example, CampFed, the educational NGO I mentioned before, they have their data collected with Magpie, and then the data is pulled into Salesforce.com, which is another computerized system that is used for more advanced data visualizations than are possible with, uh, with Magpie. Magpie's data visualizations are good, but quite basic. And so CamFed uses the enterprise account with the API to automatically flow the data as it's being collected to a more capable visualization system. Uh, note that if you go to the link that is displayed in the middle of this slide, datadine.org slash magpie-mobile, you will see a link at the bottom to this slide set. So I'm going to leave this uh, slide on the screen for while we do the questions. And at this point, I'll turn it over to the moderators to, to uh, forward questions to me, and I'll look forward to answering them. Thank you very much, Joe, for that uh, presentation. Perhaps while we're waiting uh, to have a couple questions submitted to Lauren. Joe, I have, I have one question on uh, the SMS version of, of Magpie. Does the SMS version have the skip logic capacity? That's a great question. Again, when you're using the app, you have all those interface elements, all those data controls like skip logic, required questions, etc. SMS has none of those things. SMS doesn't have range checks. SMS doesn't have skip logic. SMS doesn't have any of those things at this time. The single advantage of SMS is that it's, it, it works from any phone. Other than that, it's all disadvantage, meaning SMS is really only appropriate for quite simple data. When you're collecting, for example, one or two or three or five variables, five questions. People use the Magpie app, they have forms that are a thousand questions, a thousand questions long, but certainly that would not be possible using the, the SMS feature. We found the users who are using SMS um, and they're getting great results, they're having, for example, community health workers text each week with the number of births and deaths in their village, essentially two numbers separated by a hash mask. Very, very simple data. Um, and so, again, SMS, terrific for simple data, but it doesn't have any of those interface elements. SMS has no menus. SMS has no skip logic. Because when you're doing it, you're just using the SMS feature of your phone. You're not using the Magpie application. We have, um, I see a couple hands raised. So, um, Landon, unless you have any follow-up questions to that, I was going to pass it over to one of our participants. Okay. Simon, I'm going to unmute you. I see your hand is raised. If you have a your question. Is raised. Unmuted. Do you have a question? Hi there, Lauren. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joel, for your presentation. Um, yeah, my question is, what is the format of the, the data that's collected when it, when it comes out of there? Is it in Excel or another type of um, application? Sure. Thank you, Simon, for sure. the question. Thank you, Simon, for the question. Um, so basically, um, so the, basically the, the Magpie data can be exported uh, using any version as text or Microsoft Access or Excel. We're also looking into adding some additional formats, but those are the three basic formats. You can also, um, if you have the enterprise version, that's the top level version, with the API, um, that that bit of technology I mentioned before that allows you to automatically pull the data from the system, um, you can essentially pull it in any format that you want. I mean, it's, you're basically pulling the raw data. But for most of our users, uh, with every account, the most common way of getting their data is to export it, for example, as a text file 
or an Excel file. Uh, thanks, Virgil. Um, that's that's perfect. It was Excel that I was hoping that you would have said in that. So uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Sure. And, and it's it's the it's, it's the old Excel. It's the XLS format, not the um, XLSX format. Damien, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Joel. Welcome. Um, yeah, just a very quick question on the, the pricing and the free option. You mentioned there was a maximum of 500 uh, uploads per month um, that was available, but the, there was also uh, a storage limit of 500. Is that also a monthly limit, or is that a, a, a maximum for the entire survey? Thanks. No, let, me, let me back up the slide to that thing. So the storage limit on the free version, there, there's, there's two kind of primary limits. One is kind of a throughput, the amount of data that can flow through the system. That's the upload limit of 500 per month. There's also the storage limit. You know, at this point we've got 21,000 users and you know, more than 99% of them are free users. The problem is we wouldn't be able to afford the server space if we gave unlimited storage to each of the free users. So you can think of the free version, it's kind of like imagine a flash drive that can only store 500 completed forms. And if you were to want to store more than that, you could, for example, upload 500 records to the to the online site with the free version then download those to a you know to your hard drive or something delete the, the online records that would of course clear up your sort of flash drive to upload 500 more but it's a it's a hard limit for the online version that you can't store more than 500 um, completed questionnaires the data from 500 com completed questionnaires at any one time and again this is because I think we would easily you know, be spending enormous sums keeping the system running if we gave everyone in the world unlimited data uh, access to storage online. Now the paid versions, um, there's, there's no limit at all. So if you paid a $5,000 version, you, can, you, know, you could have gigabytes of information stored online and we're able to absorb that. But with the free version, it's a hard limit of only uploading 500 per month and only storing 500 at a time. Again, you can easily clear that out and upload them again, which can be a bit of an inconvenience, I guess. But you certainly many of our free users do exactly that in order to avoid having to upgrade. That, thanks, Joel. It's a good analogy with the, the flash drive, um, and it's, yeah, it makes sense to be able to do that. I just had a quick follow-up question, if I'm not um, hogging the, the floor too much. Um, often we have uh, a combination of paper-based and uh, online or, um, or mobile uh, data collection. I'm just wondering if if there's a an interface, um, say for a, a, a desktop PC, that you could also uh, input data, uh, or you, or if you'd have to export the uh, the mobile data to Excel and then you know manually input whatever paper forms you might have in addition to that. Right. That's a great question. Um, so right now on the website, you can actually, um, if you're if you're on the website, which means that you're connected to the internet, you can sit at your desktop or your laptop and you could enter the data from paper forms into a, an interface at the website one at a time. So for exactly the purpose that, that you're suggesting, if you have data that's on paper and you want to be able to do data entry. Um, so that's certainly possible. One thing we're just discussing right now with one of our users is um, someone's asked us, they said, look, we need to be able to do that offline. Right? We need to be able to do data collection into the website offline. And um, <coughs> excuse me, and we haven't had that up to now. You, we've had the ability to collect it on the mobile um, while unconnected, or on the website while connected. And so we're actually exploring with that user. Um, it's very likely, actually, that they're going to pay us to create a kind of a separate program, a little Java application that will run on your desktop or your laptop computer that will enable you to download a form and enter data into you know, enter data while you're not connected, and then later it will synchronize it with the website. How, that, I think, will be a nice bonus for all of the Magpie users. It also illustrates kind of one of the methods by which we operate. You know, we're always using the money that we get from subscriptions to, uh, you know, to in increase the, the value of the software, to add features, et cetera, and fix bugs. But sometimes we also have um, organizations who have money and basically they say, look, we want this feature, and we want it right now. Um, we don't want to wait for you to get around to it. The nice thing about the Magpie approach is that if an organization, for example, if this organization comes and pays us to create this offline um, desktop 
data entry system for Magpie, that system will be made available to all the users, uh, not just to the people who paid for it. A, a good example of that actually is the SMS data entry system. That SMS data entry system was paid for by the group called IRC, the International Rescue Committee, and uh, because they, they really had a need for it, and they determined that paying us to add it to Magpie was the, the cheapest, fastest way to get it. Once they paid us to, to add it to the system, it suited them and was able to do what they needed it to do, but we can also make it available to other users, which is nice. Any more questions, Damien? Thanks, Joel. That's, uh, yeah. no, thanks, Lauren. Cheers. Okay. Fernanda, do you have a question? Yes. Hi, I do. Hi. Uh, thank you for this useful presentation. My question is um, if uh, Magpie has a way to alert you in real time about duplicated data or maybe incomplete forms. No, that's a great, this is a great suggestion and we've been talking with folks about it, but right now, no, the only way that you'd know about duplicated data or incomplete forms is by, by looking at the data set and analyzing it either, you know, by eye or by doing some kind of analysis as the data is coming in. So right now, there okay. is no automatic alert to duplicated data within the system. It's a great suggestion, though. You would have to be online to manually check, um, right? You'd have to be online. Yes, you'd have to be online to manually check. Now, it's possible to to make it so that people can't enter duplicate data on the phone, for example. Um, you could you could restrict in certain ways in the form. You could stop them from doing that. Um, but again, in terms of the whole data set, to see the data set that's being uploaded to the website, you'd have to have access to the website. Oh, got it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I think we I've noticed we have about five or six more questions. So I think it's best to maybe take two more, and then um, I think Joel's going to walk through a demo, and then we can field everyone's all the remaining questions that people have. Peter had a few questions. So, Peter, what questions do you have? Yeah, sure, thanks. I, I typed out three of them, so I'll see if I can ask uh, the most interesting ones, I guess. I was wondering, and maybe you'll talk about this during your demo, but I was wondering if you could say more about the real-time data viewing. Um, I am assuming that means as data is getting collected and, and uploaded, it's visible and exportable elsewhere at sort of a central location. Yes, that's right. Okay, great. And then, um, have you have you guys done anything related to sort of some other sectors that are related to doing data collection with electronic instruments? That is, like in places, remote places where there's lack of power and lack of network. Do you have any partnerships or any, I don't know, lessons learned based on uh, the experiences of your of your users? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I guess you're talking about when data is being collected by a machine, by an instrument rather than by a person? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm talking about the use of <laughs> electronic equipment in remote areas where you, you don't have a good power supply or, or network. Oh, I see. You mean just collecting data, for example, on phones in, in rural areas? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, Magpie was born basically in Kenya, and uh, way back in the days of the Palm Pilot, before the mobile phone yeah. really exploded. And so, you know, the system, people often ask us, for example, can you collect data offline? And uh, our answer is, of course, you can collect data offline because when we started working on this, we weren't even working on phones. I mean, there was no online. So the, the system, I think, you know, nowadays, partly just through the, the constant improvement of phones, you know, battery life is improving. The, the cost of solar charging panels and other kind of charging equipment is, is dropping all the time. And so what we found is that, you know, most, it's quite easy to get a phone for $30 that works on Magpie that has a three-day battery life. Now that's assuming you're not playing games on it and you're not, you know, using it to take photographs and, and all other kinds of non-data collection activities. But it's really, um, it's quite remarkable that nowadays a $30 phone, uh, you know, basic Nokia phone, can run for days, can store tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data records, and can do all that while you're off the network. Um, so, you know, I, I would say the huge majority of our users are using Magpie in, in areas that are not connected. 
It's only now that we're starting to get people who are using it, for example, in the United States or Europe or other kind of richer countries with better connectivity. Um, the, you know, most people are, are using it where the connectivity is pretty bad. Great. Yeah, thanks. That's, yep, that's good. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Okay, so I think we'll take one more question, and then we'll let, we'll let you do the demo, Joe. Sounds good. Jarrett, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, this is Jarrett Wahardo from Save the Children. I just want to ask about, um, to, to check on a few different features. Are there timestamps, um, and are there, is there the ability to capture like audio or picture or video um, in any way? Um, and then with, when you're building the forms on, online, can you program in any sort of like validation checks, um, such as perhaps like a constrained values within a, within a single question or validation checks between different questions? Um, and finally, is there the ability to sort of, does, does, does it only work in one direction based on collecting data from the field back to a central location, or can you um, sort of maintain a, a profile of a beneficiary, for example, and, and bring that profile back out to the field um, for the data collectors to reference um, during a return visit? Sorry for the long list. So, so no, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine. I, I think we can... We can cover all that. So um, you asked about constraints. You asked about uh, is it only one way, and you asked about audio video. Is that right? Was there one before that? That's right. Also the timestamps. Oh, right, timestamps. So uh, timestamps. Right. So in terms of timestamps, right now the Magpie applications uh, stamp the data that's collected when, when you've completed the form. So if you can imagine the process, you open the app on the phone, you start entering the data into the form, and when you're done and you click, you know, next or save, uh, it timestamps that record with the, with the date and the time. Also possible to GPS stamp it, but we're actually adding, we're in the process of writing a, a first a better Android app, and then we'll be doing a better iPhone, uh, iPad app, and one of the improvements in the new Android app will be that it actually has three timestamps. It's going to timestamp it when you open the form, when you save the form, and then when you upload the data. This is kind of an example of what I mentioned about wanting to do better supervisory uh, functionality within Magpie. It, it's quite useful, of course, to be able to see when the, when the form was saved, you know, when the person finished the interview, basically. But as you can imagine, if you know when the interview or the form was begun, and you know when it was finished, and you know when it was uploaded, that's really useful metadata for supervisors because they can use that to calculate. And in fact, we're going to have the Magpie system automatically calculate this to, for example, calculate the average time to complete a form or the average time spent between completing a form and beginning the next form. You can imagine if you've ever been a data collector or supervised data collection that this is the kind of useful information that we basically never have because it would be much too time consuming to calculate this from paper data. It would be time consuming or impossible. But with real time data, we actually have the opportunity to provide supervisors with, for example, you could imagine how useful it would be in real time to have a list of here are, here's the average amount of time, um, here's a list of all your data collectors and their average time to complete a form, which would enable you to identify the data collectors who perhaps were moving too slowly, maybe they require extra training, or the data collectors who perhaps were moving too quickly and there's a question as to whether they're really filling in the form legitimately or not. Um, certainly people often think about this with GPS stamps, that they can verify the data was collected where it was supposed to be collected. But we think that with the new app and the three time stamps as opposed to just one, um, that's going to be even more useful. Um, in terms of, let's see, uh, it's certainly possible to put many kinds of data quality constraints within the form. Probably the simplest example is just making something into a multiple choice question. If you say, if you make a question, you know, on paper when you say, pick your favorite fruit, is it apples, bananas, or oranges, you know, it's quite common in data collection that the person responding might circle one or two or three of them, even though you said, choose only one. Of course, on a computerized system like Magpie, you can make that into a multiple choice question where it's not possible for them 
to choose more than one. They must select only one. Of course, you can also have questions where you say choose all that apply. Uh, for numerical questions, you can say obviously that uh, the data must be between, you know, it has to be greater than zero and less than 10, something like that. Uh, lots and lots of different ways that you can put quality constraints, put data constraints uh, on the data as it's being collected. Uh, messages that pop up if people respond in a certain way, for example. So there's quite quite a bit of ways in which you can you can do that. Um, we don't have audio or photo or video yet. However, we're working. You know, I mentioned that sometimes we get funding from individual organizations to help us to add features which will benefit that organization, but also benefit our other users. We're working with Physicians for Human Rights right now to add photo and video data collection. Um, they want to do that in order to be able to do actual legal forensic documentation when people are of, of sexual assault um, in countries where that is a, a huge problem. And, uh, but I can certainly imagine other instances where it would be useful to be able to snap a, a photograph, for example, um, and include that with the data record. Another thing we're considering doing with audio and, uh, and video and photos, uh, other organizations have asked us can they display a photo or can they play a video um, on the screen of the phone while they're doing the data collection? And you could also you can imagine how useful that might be. For example, asking a mother, has your child received this medication? You would be able to display a picture on the screen of the medication bottle or of the pill. And so the collection of audio and video data we're working on right now, the, the, the ability to display audio or video or photo data um, on the screen of the phone or to play audio. That's something we're thinking about but not yet working on. Um, and yes, you're right. For the, lar for the most part right now, Magpie is a one-way data collection system. Mostly, you are collecting data in the field and uploading it to the network. And this really has to do, I think, with our, our origins. Back in the days of paper and before the mobile phone revolution, it, it would not have been possible to think about two-way communications with remote areas in, for example, in Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. Now that it's a possibility, um, I think, you know, everybody's thinking about ways in which we could do this two ways. And so, and we are as well. I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas if you want to contact me offline um, about how we, you know, what you might use that for. Uh, we're, we're, as I said, always improving the software and, and you know, information and, and feedback from the field and suggestions from the field is the primary method by which we sort of chart our course for what we what features we add.